on the evening of September 6, 1943, a charming, likable man by the name of Li Chigun enters the fancy Broadway mansion in Shanghai. Li is pie master to Wang Shiwei's split-off Chinese government that is collaborating with the Japanese. He has come for a meeting with a man from Kempetai, the Japanese secret police and a defector of the Yungtong, the intelligence agency of the Chinese nationalist. The three have a heated discussion, but when he is invited to have dinner before resuming the talks, he is far from excited. He stares at his plate and fears that he will be poisoned. This is another episode of Pies and Ties. I'm Astrid Dinard. Hello, darlings. Today, we travel to China to look at the intricate, treacherous and very dangerous game played by the Chinese spy masters. During World War II, after years of strife between China warlords, politicians, soldiers, foreign interests and invasion, China is no longer one, but three different Chinas. Three rival ideologies are constantly fanning the flames of a bloody civil war. One, the Japanese invasion to expand its empire. Two, Western efforts to cement or expand influence in East Asia. And three, the Soviet attempt to spread communism by seeding revolution. In the back alleys of this grand multiplayer, multi-dimensional chess game, intelligence agency spies and spy masters cross, double cross and triple cross each other to gain the advantage of the other side and for themselves personally. It is a grand confusion that has been going on since 1912 when the Chinese Republic was first proclaimed. Which leads us to the first China or original Republican China of Chiang Kai-shek's nationalists, the Guomintang. They have two major intelligent agencies, the Shangtong and the Yuntong. The latter was founded in 1932 as the Bureau of Investigation and Statistics. Behind that rather boring name stands a colorful figure, Dai Li. Here he is. He's a gangster, an actual gangster. Life started off pretty well for Dai. Born into the upper middle class, he attended a posh elementary school, but then his father died young, and Dai soon ended up on the streets of Shanghai. There, he makes his living by playing poker and working for the notorious criminal organization, the Green Gang, through which he meets Chiang Kai-shek, the future leader of the Kuomintang, the Chinese nationalist movement. Chiang sets Dai on a new path. He goes to the military academy. His remarkable slick appearance is described as being of medium height and well-built, rugged looking and strong, with a crisp military manner. He has well-defined features, sharp eyes, with a direct glance and a firm, determined mouth. Already at the academy, he starts his spy career by keeping taps on his co-students for Chang. He obviously does a good job because in 1932, Shang makes Dai spy master of the new Yuntong. Now, the Kuomintang is fractured in a left and a right section and by 32 caught up in a conflict with the Chinese communists. The Yuntong are already pursuing communists and anti-nationalist enemies in the White Terror. And this is where Dai's time as a gangster comes in handy. Here's why. In his name, kidnapping and assassinations are carried out left, right and center. The favorite method 
is taken straight out of the Shanghai mobster playbook. A gunman hides in the back seat of the victim's car and when they get in, there are only two options. Either cooperation at gunpoint or immediately killed, often strangled to not make so much noise. They rounds up any imaginable perceived threat. Prisoners are frequently tortured and maimed by extract information or just out of spite. By the time the war breaks out, Western diplomats and military will call him the Chinese Himmler. He is uncompromisingly loyal to Shang and completely ruthless. He comes to personify the cruelty of the dictatorship. His reputation across China is underlined by stories about concentration camps, murders and torture. Some true, some wild fantasies. To the British and Americans, he assures that he isn't evil. Just an efficient guardian of democracy. I quote, Not a Himmler, the Generalissimo Dai Li, and nothing more. You see, China depends on supply from British-held Hong Kong and Burma. But the Allies have little interest in China's fate until the British begin to fear for a Japanese invasion of British properties in 1941. The Brits then send a mission to China to, among other things, set up an Anglo-Chinese sabotage team. It's, of course, our friends at the British Special Operations Executive SOE and their China Commando Group. But Dai loathes the British for their colonial arrogance and for their secret police operations in Shanghai and Hong Kong. At one point in 39, Dai was even arrested in a joint Japanese and British operation in Hong Kong. Anyway, he has no choice but to work with them as the war with Japan is not going so well, right? The plan is to train and arm 30,000 Chinese guerrillas. But when Japan takes all of British East Asia after Pearl Harbor in December 41, you remember, the Kwon Bin Tang back out of the program. Instead, Dai turns to the US and sets up the Sino-American Cooperative Organization, or ZACO. What he does, he persuades U.S. Navy Commander Milton Miles to train and equip 50,000 guerrilla fighters and an elite police unit, which isn't for fighting the Japanese. Chinese Himmler, remember? Between 43 and 45, Zako establishes 12 training camps. Unlike the British, the Americans will show a long-term commitment in the region, especially towards the end of the war as the threat of global communism rises. That brings us to the second China, the nationals former and in 43 still sort of allies, communist China under Mao Zedong. Their spy master is Pan Hanyan. Here he is, although Pan is not a mobster. He is a fanatical communist, which I guess is sort of a gangster as well. He joins the Chinese Communist Party in 1925, aged only 19. He quickly rises through the ranks, first as a propagandist and journalist, and then as a bureaucrat for the Central Propaganda Ministry. In 31, Pan is appointed head of the second unit responsible for intelligence and security. He teams up with a guy named Kang Sheng in charge of the third unit who are responsible for suppressing and killing traitors and spies together. They are quite successful. One of their agents, the anarchist Wang Shu, even infiltrates dies Jung Tong. There, he ultimately rises to the ranks of Major General in charge of anti-Japanese operations. But Yuan is captured by Wang Shiwai's intelligence leader, Li. But then he is saved by the Japanese. Somehow, in that whole mess, he manages 
to get the approval of both Pan and Dai to become a double agent in a Japanese intelligence operation. So, he's a triple agent. On the payroll of the communist, the nationalist, and the Japanese. But what did you expect? He's an anarchist. And this is World War II China. Which brings us to the third China. The Japanese-friendly China of Wang Xingwei. And that is when we get back to our friend from the beginning. You remember Li Shigun, who is still staring at his dinner plate. His road to power is oddly a combination of pans and dice. Like Pan, he becomes a member of the Communist Party at a young age in 1926. Like Dai, he joins the Green Gang and becomes a drug kingpin in Shanghai. And through a lot of weird circumstances, in 1932, Li starts working for the Guomintang's intelligence organization. But he's unhappy with the prospects of his career and decides to defect to the Japanese. In their name, Li forms Jessfield 76, named after the Shanghai street its office is located on. Well connected in Shanghai's criminal and Guomintang circles, he builds a vast intelligence network. So, when Chiang's old rival in the Kuomintang, Wang, splits off and sides with the Japanese to form the Nanjing Collaborationist government, this becomes their intelligence agency. And Li is very efficient. He manages both to infiltrate the nationalist intelligence community and secure communist cooperation from Pan, who he meets several times together. They set up a joint effort to strike against the Yongtong, American Front. This is confusion, and this is China. By 1942, hold your shorts, Li has 200 thousand agents at his command. When 1943 comes around, Li has not only built a formidable intelligence organization, in the process he has accumulated wealth and personal power. His Shanghai bank business is booming and he starts to form a personal militia out of defectors and warlord puppets. While he can charm any conversational partner in seconds, he becomes increasingly arrogant and likes to put his power on display. By mid-43, everyone, the Japanese, Dai's Yongtong, Pan's second unit, even his own side, see him as a threat. And his flight towards the sun, you know, the story about Icarus, comes to an end after that dinner. Remember, he fears that he's being poisoned, and he's right. Although he eats as little as possible, finding a poor appetite and stomach cramps, by the time he arrives at home that evening, he's already dying. Three days later, Li Xing Kun becomes another fallen chess piece taken off the great board of Chinese World War II politics. That's how complicated things have become. Everyone is infiltrating and spying on everyone. And everyone is cooperating with everyone against their common enemies, which is everyone. In this climate, where anyone is compromised or at least easily discredited, it won't be long before others befall the same fate as our friend Lee. Dai is taken off the board in 1946 when he dies in a mysterious plane crash, probably orchestrated by the communists, possibly with help of the US intelligence services. In 1955, 
Pan will be betrayed by his own side, accused of having collaborated with the Japanese and Wang Xingwei. He will spend the remaining 33 years of his life in a prison camp. The fate of China's World War II spy masters very much embodies the fate of the whole country. Caught in a game driven by ideological division, treachery, and a murderous fight for power, where most of the players can never win. If you want to unwind the confusion that is China in the first half of the 20th century, We've put together a playlist of the videos we've made about it so far right here. To make sure we can continue untangling the webs of history, join the Time Goes Army at patreon.com or timegoes.tv. Subscribe, ring that bell, and I will see you next time, darlings. Mm -hmm.